Hi, this is Rob. Welcome to the final video in the CSS tutorial series where we'll discuss responsive web design. Responsive web design is an approach to building web pages which display properly on all devices, such as a desktop, a tablet, or a cell phone. As we saw in the previous video in this playlist, where we compared fixed versus fluid page layouts, when resizing the browser to a width smaller than the fixed page width defined in the CSS, we had to scroll horizontally to view the content on the page. And although replacing the fixed layout with a fluid layout did display the content in the viewable area of the browser, regardless of its width when resizing, it wasn't easy to see the content as we shrunk the browser or when we viewed the page in a responsive view in developer tools. When designing web pages, we should aim to provide all users of our site with the best possible experience and ensure everyone can view the pertinent content on our pages regardless of the device they are using to access the site. This is where responsive web design comes in. This page on W3Schools provides an example of a responsive web page layout. As we resize the browser window, the content is adjusted to display within the viewable area of the browser window. And if we view the page in the responsive view in developer tools, the content on the page is as easy to see as when viewing it in a desktop view. What I'm going to do now is copy the code from this page and put it into Visual Studio Code so we can gradually walk through it and see how this responsive page is built. In VS Code, I've created a simple index.html file and a styles.css. What I'll do is view the source of the page on W3Schools and copy the HTML into my index.html template in VS Code. So I'll grab everything that's inside of the body, copy it, and paste it in. Then I'll go back and grab the CSS from the style block in the head and paste this into my CSS file. I'll save both files and then launch index.html with live server. And now we have the responsive page in VS Code that we can modify. However, before we modify the code, I want to take a look at this page in a responsive view. So if I go back to developer tools, and switch to a responsive view, we'll notice that the content on the page isn't easy to read. Now, although this page is responsive, when I copied the code from the example on W3Schools, I left out one HTML element that we need to go grab and add to our code. So up in the head section of the HTML on the W3Schools page, I need to copy this meta tag which sets the viewport to the width of the device and the initial scale to one. So I'll copy this and paste it into my code, save the page, go back to the browser, and now we can view the content on the page. So what was that meta tag and why did it make a difference when viewing the page in a responsive view? Well, that tag was used to set the viewport on the page and the viewport is the visible area of the web page in the user's device. And by setting the elements content attribute to width equals device width and the initial scale to one, we're telling the browser to set the width of the page to the screen width and its initial zoom level to one when the page is loaded. It's important to include this meta tag and these attribute values when building your pages. Now, back in the code, we'll see that they built this page using divs and class attributes referencing styles in the CSS. The first thing I'm gonna do is refactor this HTML and replace those divs with semantic HTML elements. If you're not familiar with semantic HTML tags, you may find the video I created on semantic elements in my HTML playlist informative. So to get started, I'll replace the div with the class of header to a semantic header element and delete the class. Then I'll replace the div with the footer class to a footer element and the div with the class of row to a main element. Finally, I'll replace the div with the class of aside to an aside semantic element. Inside of the main tag, I'll change the div, which has a class of menu, to nav, then switch this div tag to a section and the div below it to a section. Now, with these changes made to the HTML file, 
I want to ensure that the syntax is still correct. So what I'll do is I'll copy all of the code in this page, then go over to the new HTML checker page and paste my code, then click check. We can see I have a couple warnings on this page, but that's just due to section headers. Now, if we had errors, we would definitely need to fix those. These warnings we could ignore because when W3Schools initially built the page, they decided that they didn't need headers in the sections on their page. So we're not going to modify the page content, we're only refactoring the code. Now, if we compare the original W3Schools page to our modified page, we'll see that we're missing some styles, which makes sense because we changed the divs to semantic elements and deleted the classes that pointed to the styles in the CSS. So let's jump back over into the CSS and modify these styles to target our new semantic elements. I'll start by changing the CSS class selector of row to target our new main element. I'll then change the class of header to point to the header element and all of the classes of menu to point to our new nav element. The aside class will become the aside element and the footer class will point to the footer. We save the code, go back to the browser. Now our page has the proper styles applied. However, since I made some modifications to the CSS, I want to ensure that that code is syntactically correct as well. So I'll copy the code, then go to the W3C CSS validation service, paste it in and check. And our CSS is semantically correct. Now, one more important concept to understand in responsive design is media queries. Media queries are used in CSS to apply certain styles only if the condition specified in the media query is true. So looking at the example on this page, we see a media query is defined using the at media rule, which is only applied when the max width of the screen is 600 pixels. The only screen definition in the media query refers to the media type, which can be screen, print, or all. And all is used by default if screen or print aren't specified. The maxed width tells the browser only to apply this style and set the background color of the body to blue if the screen width is less than 600 pixels. So if we look at the try it yourself example, we see that the current width of the browser is 675 pixels. So by default, it gets the background color of light green. Now, if we resize the browser to under 600 pixels, we see that the media query is now evaluated to true and the background color of the body is changed to light blue. Of course, if we increase the width again to over 600 pixels, now the background color goes back to light green. So let's take a look at this modified example. Inside the style block, we have multiple at media rules defined for different browser widths. Starting from the bottom and working our way up, we have a media query that is applied to the screen only, so only when we're viewing the content on the screen and not in the print view. And the minimum width of the browser is 1,025 pixels, then set the body's background color to black and the font color to white. So that's what we see right now. The browser width is 1149, which obviously is bigger than 1025. And this is a standard resolution for desktop monitors. Now, looking at the media query above it, which is also applied only to the screen, if the browser width has a minimum width of 769 pixels and a maximum width of 1025, which is common for laptop screens, we'll change the background color to green and the font color to red. So if we resize this and keep an eye on the width of the browser, when we drop down to under 1025, the background color changes to green and the color red. The next media query is applied if the width of the screen is between 481 pixels and the max 769. So resizing to hit the max width of 769, we'll change the background color to blue and set the font color to yellow. And finally, for mobile phones with a common width between 320 and 480 pixels, as long as the max width of the screen is 481 pixels, we'll change the styles to have a background color of black and a color of white. So let's resize to hit that breakpoint. 
and we'll see that those colors are applied. And of course, as we increase the width of the browser and hit the different breakpoints for the media queries, the appropriate styles will be applied. So finally, getting back to our original example, we'll see that two media queries are defined, both applied only to the screen. The first looks for a min width of 768 pixels and then changes the width of the elements with the appropriate classes to a certain percentage of the parent container. The second one changes the width of those same classes to a different percentage when the min width of the browser is 600 pixels. So right now, the width of the browser is 770 pixels. If we shrink that down to under 768, we'll see that these styles are applied. And if we shrink it again to under 600, then the styles declared in this media query are applied. The last demo I'd like to show in this video is another common use of media queries, and that's to resize images and show or hide content dependent upon the values specified in the media query. So to our little demo page, I've added an image folder with an image of a mountain. In the HTML, I've added a new section. I've given the section an ID of mountain section, and I've also included an image with an ID of mountain image. In the CSS, I've added three media queries. The first one says that when the max width of the browser is 481 pixels, so 481 or below, find the element with the ID of mountain section and set its display to none. So that will hide this. So on mobile devices, we don't want to show the picture. So that whole section is hidden. If the screen width is between 481 and 769 pixels, I want to display the image, but I want to decrease its dimensions. As we move up in width of the browser to between 769 and 1025, I want to double the size or the, double the dimensions of the image. And then anything above 1025, I want to show the full image. So if we jump back to our browser and start with a dimension that will show the full size of the image, as we decrease the width of the browser and hit the various breakpoints, the image will decrease in size until we ultimately hit the mobile device breakpoint and then the image is hidden. So that concludes this CSS tutorial playlist. Thanks for sticking with me through it. I hope you learned a lot and I also hope to see you in the next playlist which will discuss the Bootstrap CSS framework.